Hello and welcome again to Charles Kelly Money Tips. Hope you're having a great day. Reporting here from a windy, wet and dark afternoon in London and uh, where it's cold and rainy. It just, it just never seems to stop raining at the moment. I don't know what's going on. Uh, so anyway, in the headline there, I said that uh, Britain's highest paid boss is 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 not a man, as, as you'd expect. It, it, it's a woman and it's not the Queen. So who is she? Well, I won't keep you in, in suspense any longer. It is, in fact, someone called Denise Coates. Yeah, you heard of her? I, I don't think so. I, my, most people haven't. I've never heard of Denise Coates. And uh, she, she's still quite young. She's an entrepreneur and is the boss of a company called Bet365. Now, if any of you are gamblers out there or you watch football and sporting things, you'll see this name Bet365. And she is the one that started it. Well, didn't quite start it. Her, uh, her father already had a sort of a high street betting uh, uh, business. And she, she then saw the potential after graduating from Sheffield University. She saw the, uh, the potential of setting up, uh, in, this is back in 2000, and in, in the year 2000, uh, and invested in the domain bet, bet365.com. And she saw the potential of online gambling. You know, basically in 2000, let's face it, you know, not many people could think that online gambling would be so big. I mean, people were, you know, barely getting into the Internet at that time. I remember Alan Sugar saying the Internet's a waste of time. You know, it takes you too long and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think he meant at that time getting onto the Internet. A lot of people still had dial up uh, um, Internet systems and modems and that sort of thing. It was, and it was. And so, so to to, have, to think about online gambling at that time was quite a big thing. I mean, setting up a website was a really big deal in those days. So uh, I think she had some foresight there. She actually studied something called econometrics, <laughs> econometrics at Sheffield University. And as, as really the, the business has just grown and grown and grown, um, the, the business pays out dividends. It's a family owned company owned between uh, father and, and son and her and uh, they, they own Stoke City Football Club, which actually made a loss last year of, of uh, 8.7 million. Uh, the company, Betsy365, made nearly 800 million last year, which is unbelievable. Now, of course, she gets some criticism. The high pay, the high pay centre executive, Luke Hidyard, Hidyard, said, uh, this looks like a cynical timing straight after the general election to come across with excess wealth and taxes on the rich and the vast gap between those who are at the top and everyone else, you know, she could have paid herself far less and, and, and still had a great life, you know. Um, so he said, there was clearly scope for those accumulating such sums to pay their workers more or contribute more in taxes. Well, I expect they pay a lot more in taxes than Luke uh, Hildyard. Uh, and I, I don't know where he who pays his money. Who pays the high pay centre? Who, who pays these people? Where, where do they get their money from? Who, who contributes to the high pay centre? I, I just don't know. But you know, I, this this is not a government official. This is someone who started a business and has built that business up from nothing. I'm sure they employ a lot of people. I'm sure they pay a lot a lot of money in tax and paye. Um, and and it looks to me like they're paying tax in the UK, although I don't know. Uh, and clearly, if you if you said right, we're going to tax these people to the hilt uh, and sort of do a, a, a Corbynite system on them, then an online firm could clearly move somewhere else and run their business from, from somewhere else and, and pay no tax in the UK. Uh, so, you know, whatever you, if you, the more you tax people and the more, the higher you put taxes up, the more loopholes people will find to, to get out of paying tax. And now it's so much easier because you can relocate businesses very much easier. If you keep tax to a reasonable level, and I, I think a corporation tax 19% is, is, is reasonable and it's lower than some of our European partners. So we attract businesses into this country. Then things will, you know, companies will stay and they'll, and they'll pay their tax. A lot of wealthy people live in the UK because it's, the tax is not too high. It's not too onerous. They pay their fair share. And, you know, there you go. I mean, the low paid don't pay any tax up to £12,500. So many people on the minimum wage are not paying very much tax at all. So, you know, whilst I don't, I'm not a great lover of gambling as such, I don't really agree with it. And I said in my, in my book, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness, that, you know, my, my dad used to gamble a lot. He used to gamble on horses and, and the pools. And, 
you know, I saw it as a bit of a mugs game and I saw it as a way of taking food off the family table. So uh, I, I don't agree with gambling, but I, at the same time, I'm not one of these people who say, well, you, you know, you shouldn't earn that amount of money because that, that doesn't really encourage entrepreneurship, does it? You know, it, people are not going to start businesses if they're, they're just going to have it taken away from them in taxes later on. So that, that's only my opinion. Uh, good luck to her. And I think it, it's sometimes right to take money out of a business when, when you can, because you never know when that business may not be here. You know, things can change in the next few years and that business could just go. Uh, who knows? I mean, I've had a business which you know was worth loads of money at one point and then suddenly it was worth almost nothing. So you've got to take some of the benefits out of the business. These people who say, well, I'm plowing everything back into the business. I'm not taking any money out of the business. What for? You know, take some money. You've got to take something out of the business. You've got to live. You've got to enjoy life a bit and obviously leave money in there to reinvest. But I, I think you should take some of the benefits out of the business because you never know what's around the corner. You know, it's a competitive world. Uh, who knows? Some some uh, bigger shark may come along and eat them up. Who, who knows? Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things. So good good luck to her. I, whilst, having said that, I mean, I, I think we should look at the, the pay of some of the people who who are the chief executive of government departments. Uh, they they used to be called civil servants and used to be paid be paid on a, a civil servant uh, pay scale, which was reasonable, very well paid, and then they get their knighthood at the end and all that sort of stuff. Now. They're, they're, they're chief executives, aren't they? You know, the chief, exec, chief executives of the, the NHS Trust of whatever, you know, Barts or, or London or Manchester, you know, and, and they get paid fortunes, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Chief executives, again, this is another a term that once you pay someone as a, as a chief executive, once you change their title to chief executive, suddenly um, it, it becomes a, a high paid position. And you say, oh, we've got to pay people uh, commensurate pay scale to chief executives. Well, they're not chief executives. They're just people running a monopoly business. They're, they're just bean counters. They're, they're not in a marketplace like Denise Coates, where she has to build her market share. If you're running a, a typical council or uh, a, an NHS trust, you're not a business person. So I don't know why they're called chief executives. They should, should go back to civil servant pay scales. And, you know, you've got People running universities on half a million pounds. Uh, uh, what, what do you call them? They're not called chief executives. They're, they're called uh, the, the chief executives. Um, oh, the, the name's gone now. But I, I don't agree with paying uh, someone who's running a, a university half a million pounds. I don't agree with that so many bosses of councils, chief executives again, are earning a hundred to £150,000 a year. 100000 a year. And, and believe me, the council, uh, you know, I've been a council and I can see that things pretty much tick over. All they're there for is to collect money and, and clear your bins away and provide a few other services in between. That's that's what they do in, in effect. So why do you need a, a chief executive? Are they competed against other councils? Are they out there in the marketplace? Are they trying to attract? No, they're just sitting there moving things along, collecting the money, paying it out, making sure it's all there. And, and it gets audited and that sort of thing. So those are the people I think we sh the high pay uh, group should l look at. Not, not um, you know, in other words, people who are paid by the taxpayer who are, are, are taking so much money out of the system. Uh, anyway, that's my little rant on, on that. Um, now, t today we had the, uh, uh, the Queen's speech and Boris Johnson laid out his terms for the next sort of conservative agenda. So I'll just briefly tell you what, what they're going to do. Obviously, the, the main thing on the agenda, and it's announced by the Queen, she says, my government, my government. Now, she hasn't got any power as such, but she is the head of state. So she will say, my government will do this, my government will do that. And, and then the government go on. When they write the speech for her, let's face it. So uh, and, and she said in, in that my government will get Brexit uh, push Brexit through by the 31st of January. They're going to look at the NHS. They're, they're going to look at, uh, uh, at, at other things like immigration and uh, the social care system. Th those were the main things. Now, immigration, they're looking at setting up an Australian-style points-based system. Uh, strange enough, I thought we already had a points-based system that was brought in by the Labour government, and uh, that, that was a, a big 
you know, multi-billion pound expenditure to bring in a system which was a five-tier points-based system. That's what I thought. You get points for so many things. You know, if you're coming in on a student visa, you get X amount of points for this, X amount of points for that. Isn't that a points-based system? Why do we need to, to revamp the whole thing? Surely you can just tweak that system. You can say, right, we're going to add a further tier to that or we're going to change that tier to that. I, I really don't see why they need to spend fortunes and bringing in lots of consultants and highly paid people and uh, computer people uh, and, and change the whole system over again because it, was gonna, it will cost billions and, and reorganising that department. Uh, I remember when the departments like the Home Office and the NHS and the tax people brought in companies like, like Fujitsu, for instance, that, that ruined the post office. Uh, they brought the, these companies in and spent billions trying to integrate you know, the NHS system. Integrate. What happened to that? Nothing. No one got sacked. It was just a waste of money. Uh, the NHS had another system. The, the tax office had another system. I, I don't know what happens. They spend billions on this. And I could see that happening if they just try and scrap the old system and, and bring in a completely new points-based system. Uh, they, they want to control immigration. Uh, I, I think that there is a, a need for that. You, you've, you've got to bring in the right people that, that we need in this country to do the jobs we need. Uh, for instance, there's a big, vac a huge amount of nurses needed, perhaps 40,000 vacancies that, that are needed in the UK. Boris Johnson said in his campaign that he would do something about that. And I think they were looking to bring in about half that amount from overseas. So we'll, we'll have to watch this space and see what happens. Obviously, you need to train your own people as well and, and make it easier for nurses to become nurses by giving them proper support and bursaries and that sort of thing. And I think that will come back in. Uh, but I think you, you must bring in the people that the country needs. Any country, whether you look at Australia, Canada, the US, uh, any, any other country with it that is desirable to live in, New Zealand, another one, they, they'll have a, a system, a point system, which will they, they will attract the people they want to attract. Like if they need teachers, they'll they'll make it attractive for teachers to come over. Ireland is the same. When Ireland needed us, they were recruiting from from Europe and overseas. But you can't just let anybody say, right, I'm I'm coming in. You know, you, you've got to have some controls, because unless you bring in higher paid workers. They, they will always be supported by the state. As I said earlier, the low paid do not pay much tax because the first 12,500 is tax free. They're now planning to make even national insurance tax free up to that, that amount. So somebody on minimum wage where they're earning, say, 13 or 14,000 pounds, they're not paying any tax. They don't contribute to the economy, as, as, as some people claim. They're not contributing to the economy. And then if they've got, say, children at school, each child costs four to five thousand pounds per year to put them through school. So two children is ten thousand going out, and they're not paying any tax. If they use the, the NHS and hospitals, and and their family come over and 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 they've got diabetes, that that is a drain on the economy. It's not adding to the economy. Whereas if you get professional people in, people that we need, there's no point in bringing in a load of people, and and they're just displacing the the the, the, the existing population. They're just taking jobs that would otherwise be taken by them. Um, you, you've got to bring in the people that that fit in and, and do the jobs that we haven't got people to do, not do the jobs that people don't want to do. That The people in this country that don't want to do the jobs should be forced to get off their backsides and do those jobs, whether they like it or not. And that means that the benefit system has got to be reformed to make people literally get off their asses and do the jobs that they that they, they're saying that we don't want to do. So well, let's bring in people from overseas because we haven't got these people to do the jobs. That's nonsense. You know, unemployment is low at the moment. We've still got a million people unemployed in this country. What, what, what are they doing? Who's supporting them? Us, the taxpayer. So control immigration, bring in the right people. Uh, I had a business bringing in nurses, so I believe in it. But I don't believe in just mass open door immigration and bringing in the wrong people. And then, uh, then you're just competing with the local population for jobs and it ends up with people on the dole or being supported by the state. So there you go. Highest paid lady. Uh, and 320 million. I think she'll have a nice Christmas. Uh, Boris Johnson, I think, will have a nice Christmas with his uh, massive majority. And he was smiling today in Parliament. And I hope we all have a nice Christmas, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. So thanks for listening. And uh, hi to everyone on uh, Facebook Live. Hi to Dave there. I hope you're doing well. And I I'll speak to you again soon. Bye for now.